Music Matters. Bed, how you doing today, brother? Thank you for coming on. Uh, doing good, man. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, of course, dude. Of course. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. I've been a fan of your stuff for a while. I um, I saw you for the first time at that show at Kaidi Studios, like in vitro and Will Awake and Israel's Arcade. And um, yeah, I've been like a fan of your stuff ever since. But it's been super sick, man. It's really exciting to have you on. Thank you, man. Yeah, that, that was a that was a fun show. I think that was our first show of the year. Yeah, uh, yeah that was like what? It was like the, like the fourth, the fifth. Or it was like right after. The, yeah, it was like right before New Year. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. sick, dude. That spot is so cool. Like, <laughs> that was my first time going there, and it felt like with like the all white walls and shit. Like, it feels like you're like performing on a cloud. Like, it's so crazy. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, um, they didn't mic us up, but the sound was still like super sick. Yeah. Like, um, yeah, we just blasted our amps and, and it uh-huh. was tight. It really just filled up and and yeah, it, it was a cool spot. It, it was uh, we actually planned to do a music video there, but oh sick, yeah, yeah, yeah nice. Yeah, it felt super DIY. I feel like like my favorite venues I think right now are things that feel like they still feel DIY enough to feel like a house show or mm-hmm. something like a warehouse type show, mm-hmm. but like it still sounds good. It's yeah. kind of like that middle period, like makeup music where you're playing mm. a couple months, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I've never been there, but I, I, I hear really good things about it. Super sick. Yeah, we threw that show there. Uh, my bad, I'll just hit you. We uh, threw that show there a couple oh, weeks ago. okay, okay. And yeah, that place looks sick. Yeah, it's really dope, man. It, it's very much like a, I don't know, it's kind of like that middle ground. Like, it's technically still a warehouse, mm-hmm. but it feels like a venue enough, you know, to mm-hmm. where, like, the sound is good. Like, there's good lighting and stuff, and there's a bar. It feels venue adjacent, but it's, like, okay, okay. it's always that kind of DIY ethos, you know? Okay, okay, that's sick. Did you grow up playing, like, a lot of more traditional venue shows or, like, house shows and stuff? Because it's been no. cool. <laughs> yeah, it's been cool to, like, kind of get into the scene that you're in because it seems like a lot of the bands in it are very, like, kind of DIY, playing a lot of, like, house shows, backyard shows. Like, what kind of shows did you come up playing? So my first show ever was actually, actually, mm, it was kind of at a venue. It, it was at this like, um, the place had a stage. It looked kind of like a like a church room, but it was cool. actually at a at a friend's art show. Um, they asked us if we wanted to play, and um, at the time, like, I honestly didn't even have a band. So yeah, yeah. So I was still making like music in my room, and uh, so my first show ever was literally just me just playing along to like my tracks and stuff and uh-huh. just like sing along and played guitar to it and um i think after that um i started playing shows like in the valley and stuff but those were like way more traditional like backyard yeah. shows and then um after that it was just yeah backyard shows for a long time mm. mm-hmm. so when, when you started was it was it just you and did you start like because that was one the one thing i wanted to ask too so like you are writing pretty much everything right and then you bring it to the band right that's how it was before uh-huh. so um <clears throat> pretty much everything on the self-titled i wrote um but yeah the, like <clears throat> sorry uh so yeah up until like the self-titled even even like wa- like songs like waves and tear you out i pretty yeah. much wrote the whole thing and then i would bring it to the band and then like it would change a little bit you know just because like everyone had their own influence on it uh-huh. but for the most part it was uh yeah pretty much like all of my I guess orchestrations, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, but now with like all this new stuff, especially with the new lineup, um, I feel like everyone kind of has more to contribute and stuff. And like, yeah. honestly it, it's, I like it um, because like our new drummer, Joey, he's one of the best drummers I've ever worked with. And like, it's cool. Cause like, um, whereas like uh, before I would, I'd be like, all right, this is what I want you to play. Like this is what I want you to do. Um, now I kind of just throw a riff at him, and he's honestly playing what I want to hear anyway. Interesting, okay. Yeah, and then Alex on guitar, um, I mean, he plays a lot of stuff that, like, I wouldn't come up with on my own, and yeah. I end up really liking. And so I'm cool. like, all right, yeah, that's cool. Like, let's leave it in there. And then Kenneth, like, he does his job really well as a bass player, and, like, he does it very well, and he just locks in. And it's cool because he works, he works so well with, like, Joey, our drummer, and uh-huh. so, like, they're locking in and stuff. And so I'm honestly not even really worried about, like, everything else. So, like with this with this new lineup like it's just been more of us like more of everyone kind of locking in and creating something that's while it's still like you know stuff that i like to play and stuff that i like to hear like on the record and stuff um yeah it's uh it's going in a really cool like more unified direction sick yeah Mm -hmm. that's really sick man i think it's really cool like over like when you have a band that exists for like a long period of time like watching the way in which the dynamics change over time because mm-hmm. it, it's very interesting, right? As, you know, members come and go, things change, and it's, like, as you kind of, like, move forward as a band, it's so cool to watch, like, how something can begin and how different it gets, you know? Like, yeah. kind of that, like... Because it's, it's so interesting, because, like, you can, like, 
enter something, right? With like just yourself, right? If you were just writing these songs, you can bring them to the band with a certain image in your head, but then like something entirely different can come out of it. Yeah. Like it could change infinite amount of times, which yeah. is the cool part about it. Mm-hmm. Do you, when you started writing in a, when you started like writing in your room pretty much, was that just like you solidified by yourself? And like, why did you start? Um, honestly, I started making music. I knew I really wanted to like start like getting serious and like making music when uh, uh-huh. I, I went to my first local show. How old and are you? I'm 23 now. Okay, nice. Yeah, yeah. So I, when I was like 15, I was still in high school. Um, I saw, I saw this band play. Um, they, they were called Playing Tours Forever. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, the the front man who who wrote the music for that, they have a new band called Blueberry. They're very cool. Go check them out. Um, I saw them play, and then from then on, I was just like, dude, like we're literally the show was in the, in the middle of a desert somewhere behind like my old high school. Yeah, and it was just like super super DIY. Like literally, they had generators to power everything, and that's when I was like, dude, this is so cool. And then like I started kind of hanging around more of like my musician friends. And I saw what they were doing, and I was like, dude, this is super cool. Like I want to do this. So started making a music in my room, and like I started putting it out, not thinking it would go anywhere. Like I just put it out just because it was fun, you know. Yeah. And, like, but yeah, everything was done by me, and like. I mean, I don't know if you want to count, like, um, what's it called? Uh, I'm, I'm blanking out. Like, garage band drummers. You know, uh-huh. I was my drummer, but, like, the rest of it was pretty much, yeah, just me orchestrating everything, yeah. playing on the guitars, guitar parts, and, and yeah, it was, it was pretty much how I came about. Did you start, like, production-wise and everything? That was all you as well? Like, you just started you, straight out the gate? You taught yourself how? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it was a lot of YouTube, like, tutorials Sick, and stuff. dude, yeah. yeah. I always I say that all the time. Like, everything that I have done creatively my entire life has been, like, learned off of YouTube, you know? Like, I don't know what the fuck I'd be doing if it wasn't for <laughs> YouTube, bro. And yeah. it's, such an inter- it's, it's such an interesting generation because I feel like I, I have never thought about this till now. But it's, mm. like, if you wanted to, like, make – let's say, like, you existed, like, 40 years ago and mm. had the, went through that same exact experience, you just wouldn't be able to, like – go yeah. figure it out on your own like you literally have to have somebody teach you you know yeah literally like um it's steve lacy right that makes all his mm-hmm. like music on his phone and like yeah. i think he won like a grammy off that shit and it's yeah. just like like now it's just so much more accessible and way more just like feasible to like really want to get into something you know it may not be at the level or production level that you know you can get to but i mean it's so much easier to start like yeah. nowadays. it's interesting too because it's like i think because it's so much easier to start we have a lot more like high quality stuff but because it's so easy to start so many people start and then never try to get better like so many people yeah. start and then like never stick with it long enough to get to a place where they're like expanding a lot in their sound you know and growing a ton so i feel like you get a lot of people who like just begin and then end i was at a i was at a show recently and i saw this act it was i'd never seen him before but i, I ended up like talking to him after the show mm-hmm. and we learned that we like knew a bunch of the same people which is super weird because we were, mm-hmm. like, were from like totally different places and yeah we were talking for a while and I, and I realized I was like, yeah, dude, like I was thinking about like, how weird is it that I knew so many people that he knew? And then I was thinking like, I was like, okay, well, like, how is that possible? Right. Mm-hmm. And then it kind of dawned on me. I was like, well, I feel like 95% of people who start making music or I like, get into music in any way, shape or form, they probably like stop after like four to five years, I would say. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's like, I feel like if you pass that threshold, like you get past that like four or five year mark, mm-hmm. it's so much smaller because then everybody knows each other at that point, you know? Yeah, I, I feel like um, hmm, that definitely happens and it could be for like different reasons, you know, sometimes yeah. like people choose to like, you know, chase to like other careers or mm-hmm. other passions and stuff, which is fine, you know? Totally. But, um, you know, if like music is something that you really want to do, like you're going to do it like yeah for as long as you want and as long as you can like no matter like where you end up or where you feel like you know what you want to do like um i don't know like i i i would feel like even if i never got all the opportunities that i did i would still be doing music in my room yeah you know because like at the end of the day i do it for me mm-hmm. and i have a lot of fun doing it i think when you go into with that mindset too like you're able to kind of go past some of the frustrations that people get when they're thinking about it like super, super, super seriously. Yeah. Like I think that was something that like I did for a long time, but that was like really, really bad. It's like I would like prioritize not the fun of what I was doing, but like the success of it. Mm-hmm. And I don't necessarily think you can get the success without first having the fun, you know? Cause yeah. like that feeling is also like translatable. Like people feel that feeling, you know? Mm-hmm. Do you think like 
when you started it versus now you've learned a better way to balance it? Because I know you were talking about how you still still a regular full time job as well and have to pay mm-hmm. bills and things. So like over the years, have you got better at kind of balancing both those worlds? And if so, how? Um, I'll be honest. I owe a lot of it to my pops. Um, so I'm blessed enough that like I I work for him, and mm-hmm. so that that gives me a lot of like like leeway and a lot of like freedom to yeah really like chase what I want to do you know and so mm-hmm. and, I, and a lot of people don't have that you know so I can't really speak for people that I guess like aren't in my place you yeah know? Um, but you know like I feel like I, I've, I've been able to balance it pretty well because of that you know like um, I'm able to like take advantage of opportunities and like yeah. really like chase stuff like for example like, I can tell my dad like hey like um, I'm going on tour next week or you know in a few months for like a whole weekend for like five days I need the time off he's like all right you know because like he my dad supports us and cool. supports me and like what we do and what I do like so much that I, I owe a lot of it to my parents. Yeah. That's so sick. Yeah, it, it's tight. And, and I realize a lot of people don't have that. So that's why I, you know, take what they give me and like try to do the most of it and, and try to do the most of what I can with it. Yeah. Cause like, you know, I never know where I can end up with this. And if I end up somewhere mm-hmm. where, you know, somewhere where I never thought I'd be, I definitely want to like, pay it forward and pay it back you know? yeah 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 of course were they ever involved in music when they were younger or like were they just always fans of from the outside like what is their involvement in music like um no so as far as i know uh you know because like parents lore can get kind of lost and stuff <laughs> um, yeah dude for sure <laughs> um i know my i think my dad would go to like shows and stuff but i don't think no i don't think any of my parents really like involved in music and stuff uh-huh. like the only other person in my family I can think of, like, as a musician would be, I guess, my uncle who played piano. But Sick, okay. he kind of just had a piano at his house, so I'd, like, play it, you know. Uh-huh. Um, my sister picked up guitar, and I picked up guitar. Or we both picked up guitar at, like, the same time. Yeah. But, no, like, I, I, I'm i the only musician, like, in my family pretty much. Okay, yeah. yeah. That's that's so interesting. We were Because I feel like you either often pick it up from, like, and, and this is my experience talking to so many people, I think, but, like, you, I feel like most of the time musicians get it from like either at least the ones that are our age get it from like their parents, the internet, or their scene. Yeah, you know, it's like one of those three things, and it seems like you kind of got it from like your scene more than anything. That oh, was definitely. Like what inspired you to get into it? Yeah, definitely. Can you talk more about it? Like, because we were talking about it earlier, kind of like that scene that's up in Lancaster. Like it, you said, pre-COVID there was like a pretty large scene of bands there, and also like what's that area just like like? Is it is it like considered? It's not like Central Valley. It's like. I, it, well, uh, I don't even know what it's considered. I could be wrong in my in my term terminology, uh-huh. but I I the high desert. I okay, guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, Antelope Valley is like is consisted of like a few cities, right? So there's uh-huh. Lancaster, Palmdale, which and Palmdale's broken up um, into like East Palmdale and West Palmdale. Okay. But um, it's all part of the same valley. And then there's Quartz Hill, and then Little Rock, and I think Victorville is still part of it. Also uh-huh. Mojave, Rosemont, but. The music scene, the DIY scene, was pretty much just Lancaster, Palmdale, and a little bit of Court Till sometimes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like like pre COVID, there was a what's it called? There was a, a thriving scene. Like there, we had bands like Witch Nally's, Blueberry, Los Mangos. Um, who else? We had we had a few other bands that were that that were a lot, but those are like the main I can remember right now. Is it a really um, populated area? Like, do a lot of people live there? I, it's definitely gotten a lot more populated lately yeah. only because like the air force base and stuff like that okay, and they yeah. have like this aerospace program and stuff and it's like it's funny like every year like we're always like dude there was never this much traffic before and like <laughs> yeah. now we have traffic and it's crazy but um but yeah it's it's definitely growing um but small town like i mean i asked you, you asked me earlier like oh yeah. where are you from lancaster where is that i get that all the time but yeah we're just like an hour north of la okay um very like I mean, it's a desert. There's nothing really out there, but uh-huh. um, you know, uh, in the scene, we made the most of it with what we could. And I mean, I still remember some of those shows. Like they were popping off, and it was it was tight as fuck, you know. And like, um, then this venue opened up called Transplants, and uh, what's it called? A lot of the shows started happening there. And then, but like I said, then after COVID, a lot of that slowed down. Just yeah. kind of came almost to a stop. And a lot of the bands that were play out there, like, either don't play in that area anymore or they just kind of like i don't know i guess they fizzled out a little bit yeah i think COVID made me realize how fleeting a music scene can be yeah like it's really something that like i never considered like it's it's so fickle because yeah. like re- in reality like i think the the idea that a music scene exists anywhere is like the craziest like most that you should be so grateful for it you know yeah and it's like you don't realize how like thin those things are you know because all the real it's not like there's any like 
actual organization to like the idea of like a scene you know mm -hmm. it's just like a group of artists who like happen to be around each other and happen to be in the same place at the same time so like mm -hmm. it just becomes that like community you know but it's it can so quickly just be gone yeah yeah literally and then it's just like it's it's one of the most organically built things you know because yeah. like you know it, it's a lot of that happens through a lot of the growth happens through word of mouth through like um i guess just like social media and stuff you know and like uh I've heard of people gatekeeping like where the addresses are and stuff like that. I so luckily, weird. Yeah, luckily I never went. I never like, like uh, went through anything like that, or there was really nothing like that in our scene. But, yeah. Um, but I mean, it was cool. Like our scene was very accepting and stuff, um, and it was tight. Yeah. When did you kind of transition out of playing shows there and then start playing more shows in LA? Because that's where you're playing most of your shows now, right? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. Uh, honestly. We started really playing venues after after this, the first support tour that we went on. Uh huh. Which which was with uh, who? Uh, Beach Goons. Oh, cool. Yeah, nice. we, yeah. We were supporting Beach Goons, and then um, it was crazy. Yeah, that was. How it, did that come about? How did Beach Goons find you? Dude, I don't know. I I honestly I I've uh, I've asked before, and and he was just like I was just scrolling, and I found you guys. So, so yeah. I mean, I did I ever plan for that kind of shit? But no. But um, it it was yeah, it was insane. Like uh. It was funny because like I threw a show in my backyard, like a week after we played uh, that video I was talking about transplants, uh -huh. and then we played that backyard show, and then like the next day, you know, I'm just in my room, just like you know, like going through that like post show or post show depression, you yeah. know, like because you go through such a high, people, you know, in the crowd, you know, and then you go home and you're just like, all right, uh, I got work tomorrow, whatever, yeah. you know. But I was just chilling, and then all of a sudden, I get this fucking DM, and it's like Beach Goons, and they're like, hey, like want to go on tour with us? First show at the Fonda Theater, it's uh -huh. sold out what yeah the, that's like, so crazy dude i wanted to throw up because i was like the fonda theater like, yeah and so i called my drummer and he didn't even believe me and i was like dude no and so like it was crazy it was definitely like definitely like a shift in that's all of insane. our careers and stuff like that and and then yeah and then after that support tour we came back and we were like okay we have to like like put something out we have to like keep the ball rolling you know because we had a lot of eyes on us and we were like let's do something with it and so my drummer Axel actually he recommended uh, the the studio that we, that we work with now um, with Alex Strada mm -hmm. used to be in Studio City I could be wrong forgive me Alex if you see this but but yeah so we started working with Alex and then um, we put out the record he produced it made it sound super sick like mm -hmm. still holds up today obviously because totally. it's just amazing and then um, after that we started getting opportunities and I think our first show. Hmm, I could be wrong, but I think our first show was actually with Wayward in Riverside. Cool. And then from there, like, because we put the album out, you know, when we had that momentum, just started getting hit up for shows and stuff like that. Yeah. More LA. And, and then, yeah, it was tight. We got, and then, yeah, the rest, you know, you can literally see it on our Instagram. So. <laughs> that is so crazy because that moment that you described where you get that, like, DM, it's like, holy shit, where did this come from? Yeah. That's, like, a moment that I feel like every musician thinks about forever, but, like, it very rarely actually comes. And those who find success a lot of the time, it's just, like, built up over years and years and years and years. So it's interesting to hear you say that because, like, obviously you started a long time before that, you know? Yeah. Did you feel like, did you have any traction, like, up to that point or was that, like, a big turning point for you? Um, I remember feeling like, okay, like things are getting like cool, you know, like we're getting more follows, more, more engagement, um, like pre COVID uh -huh. and then we were going to play this Riverside show and we used to play in Riverside a lot. Like, like our, our crowds were always really dense and, and, uh, and they were always really fun shows. And then, yeah, then COVID hit and then it was just kind of like, boom, you know? And then, yeah. uh, but I think during that time I was still putting music out. I mean, I was a bedroom artist anyway, you know? So uh -huh. I was like, okay, well like this just means i can't play shows but i'm still gonna put stuff out you know everyone's home anyway you uh -huh. know and so so that was cool and then uh yeah what did you um kind of do during that COVID period like was that like a writing period for you was that like a period of rest or thinking like what mm -hmm. did you kind of do because I, I know a lot of musicians that like <laughs> dude it's just so tragic like people like were getting the traction and then it's like one day it's all just gone yeah um I mean, honestly, hmm. I played a lot of Rocket League. <laughs> time, yeah. And uh, um, I got just really into, like, stay-at-home hobbies, you know, gotcha. like uh, like streaming, gaming. Um, but, I mean, the music was always there. And I remember one time I actually got – I had actually gotten COVID, so I was home for a month. So, like, I was literally just, like, up playing guitar, like, throughout the whole night. Um, I put out a little record at the time, and then I was like, what the fuck is this? This is just <laughs> stuff I made, so I yeah. took it down. 
but um a lot of those ideas like i ended up just keeping and then they came or i, I kind of used them for like the the self side but i mean throughout the COVID, to answer your question um mm-hmm. yeah it was just writing um just kind of focusing because i had the time you know yeah. i had the time and then um the what were they called those checks that everybody was getting the uh the stimulus yeah the yeah. stimulus those were hitting so like those you know, were fire yeah so i was just like it was a good time you know yeah. and so i was just at home writing and stuff and then once like you know we saw like the light at the end of the tunnel it was like okay like now we have material to work on Sick. Um, then the band got back together and then we just started you know like writing and really developing and and then um well i showed them what i had written and then yeah and then yeah Gotcha. That makes sense. Okay, so there's the Beach Goons tour. COVID happened. When well, it was COVID happened. Then Beach Goons. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. COVID happened. And then the Beach Goons tour. After that, you you said you started coming out of LA more. When do you feel like you sort of? Because I don't know. It. I feel like you like bed is very much part of like a a pretty thriving like LA adjacent scene. It seems like you know with a lot of really sick bands right now. Mm-hmm. When do you feel like you started to kind of like? Cause, I mean, even even the bands you're you're about to go on tour with, right? Like way where to make out reef like very much a part of like that Southern California music scene that I feel like there's kind of a circuit of a lot of those bands right now that are playing some really cool spots some really cool shows. Mm-hmm. When do you feel like you like grew out a base of like other bands that you were friends with and like people you could play shows with and like kind of got to the place where like you were able to like have enough of a network to like put together events yourself or, and or like get offers for them. Mm, you say like when, when did that kind of come about? Mm-hmm. Um, hmm. Honestly, I feel like after the the unquiet stuff came out, like the the the, the second one, mm-hmm. um, I don't know. I mean, I had, hmm, I just connected with a lot of people throughout yeah. the scene, you know, and uh, and then we got on, on like a real like a lot of really cool support shows. Like I think we landed this. Uh, uh, oh yeah, and then sorry, um, I'm just trying to like answer your question. Uh, hmm. Cause like definitely after like the, I think it might have been the first unquiet session. Like uh-huh. We started getting like a, like way more like really cool opportunities. Like we did nothing fest, and then um, we did that one, and then it, oh yeah, and then after nothing fest, we went on another support tour with Beach Goons. Sick. And then, yeah, and then that launched like like uh, and that was a longer tour. Like yeah. we went all the way to like Canada. And nice. Then, yeah, it, it was really fun. It, it, it was tight. And then I think by when we came back, we had a lot of traction. Then I was like, okay, like. I think I know enough people to like start kind of like just throwing my own shows and stuff. Yeah. I mean, I had always been throwing my own shows, like mm-hmm. even beginning, like even around like uh, my uh, my hometown, like because that was kind of the way to do it, you know. Um, I wasn't really like too close or homies with uh, like the bands that were like playing like all the cool shows and stuff like that. So I was like, all right, you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna do my own thing, and so yeah. I started throwing my own shows. But like, I would have like all like the the bands with like the bigger followings like play like headline it and then i would gotcha. be like either main support or just before that you know yeah and so smart yeah and so i started building all that and then and yeah so i, w- I would say maybe like two three years ago is when i started gotcha. really like taking the reins of like what i wanted to do and like sick yeah and just kind of like orchestrating like you know my moves yeah so. yeah happy daps kind of feels like a really cool manifestation in that scene too yeah like, i think like like the, that festival is kind of like when I think of like the scene that is kind of like at least the one that I've like I'm pretty interested in like Southern California music right now like it feels like that kind of scene like all those bands that are playing that festival mm-hmm. yeah dude I'm, I'm so excited to go to that it's gonna be so fun yeah that show's gonna be fucking wild yeah like, I think it's almost sold out and sick yeah if it's anything like the last one I mean it's gonna be fucking crazy and it's cool because I'm playing this time you know? yeah like last time I went to support Wayward like, they were the homies but I mean almost every band on that lineup that like i have friends in you know and yeah. i was just so stoked i mean young gatita played that one and like they did a super i mean they're one of my favorite bands and, yeah like, i was so hyped in that crowd and it was tight and uh and yeah and like if it's anything like last year uh-huh. dude it's gonna be fucking crazy yeah, yeah yeah no dude i feel that plus it's it's like i'm trying to think like how many i wonder how many tickets they can sell like, like i wonder what it caps at because it's two stages mm-hmm. so it's like it could be damn bro like yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be, it's gonna be huge because observatory is what it's like well over seven hundred, eight hundred. I could be wrong, but I think it's eight or eight fifty. Okay, con- shit. Yeah, and then con rooms like three fifty, four fifty. Damn, bro. Okay, sick. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be so fun. Yeah. yeah so on, like a thousand people, give mm-hmm. or take. That's gonna be fucking crazy. Damn. Yeah. I uh, I'm really pumped. To st- yeah, I'm, I'm actually stage managing it, which is like super exciting because they just like randomly hit me up to do it. 
Um, but it should be fun. I've, <laughs> I've like never done that, but like mm-hmm. I've thrown enough shows to where like I definitely know like what it means. But it's like I don't know. I'm excited to see like what it's like kind of stage managing for something of that magnitude. So it'll be, it'll be, it'll be fun, bro. Yeah. Oh yeah, man. It sounds like a sick experience, you know. Yeah, it should be a good time. What what size rooms were the were the Beach Goons tour the Beach Goons shows? Um, hmm. like is that is this is ha- is this Happy Daps gonna be the biggest show you've played? You think? No. So um. I think so. The biggest show I've ever played was the first one from the first tour. So that was Fauna Theater, right? Okay, so that yeah. Was, that was fifteen hundred people in one Jesus. room. Jesus. Yeah, I remember when those curtains opened. I just saw a sea of people, and then pe- like, <sighs> I, like, look, a sea of people is one thing, but then like a fucking second level of yeah. like people like just sitting down, like watching you, and I'm just like, ah, oh, like, fuck, whoa, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I was like, fuck it, like let's just rip it anyway. Yeah. yeah. But, um, but yeah, um, the on the tour, I think it was like. Like as we got out into like the the more east coast, um, I think the 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 rooms were like three hundred cap and stuff like nice. that. Nice. Okay. I, I, I remember this one venue called Reggie's in Chicago. That show was fucking cool. Um, I think it was like four fifty cap or nice. like five hundred cap. Yeah, that that was fun. I fucked yeah. up my leg. How? <laughs> um, I. I had injured it earlier. Um, I do jujitsu, so like oh, I cool. yeah, so like um, I fucked up my knee, and then on stage like. I had a few drinks before the set, you know, it, it was tight, but I think I just stepped weird and my knee just gave out. And next thing I know, I'm on the ground. I'm just like, what the fuck? And then, uh, that's the homie Eric. He actually, um, he was, he was doing photos and, and he was, uh, he was, he was like managing the tour. Um, he came and like, before I even knew I was on the ground, he was already like picking me up and like, oh, he was, good like, ass guy. Yeah. He, he was sick. He was sick for that. And then, uh, he picked me up and then, um, I was just like, oh shit. And then, I, I got like I just like I remembered uh sorry um I think like the guy who's running the show or some someone from the venue came up to me and was like do you want to like like are you alright like do you want to keep going and I was just like yeah <laughs> and so I kind of like hopped back over to the mic yeah and then because I was like dude if Dave Grohl can break his fucking leg and like still like yeah. play a show crazy like, yeah, yeah and I was like dude I'm Dave Grohl right now you know <laughs> but, <laughs> but um I just kept it going and yeah. then it was fun and then I I told I think I said something like well I can't move around so I need all you guys too and then the, they just oh that's yeah sick. It just amplified the energy and yeah and it was tight yeah damn dude yeah that's so cool how does like like that's interesting that like you were talking about doing jujitsu and then also being on tour and stuff it made me think like having that lifestyle balance when you're on tour was that difficult like because. You said how many shows were on that first tour? Oh, man. The first one was a week and a half, so I want to say maybe, uh-huh. like, six, seven shows at most. And the second one? Uh, that The second one, fuck, like, 19 or 20 shows. Okay, shit, yeah. yeah. How do you kind of, like, maintain that lifestyle when you're, like, trying to balance? Like, it seems like, you know, you're saying you do 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 jujitsu that's a hard thing to say <laughs> you do jujitsu and stuff um so I imagine somebody like wants to take care of yourself on tour and stuff is that like a difficult balance to have um i'll be honest like on the road like we're on the road the whole time you know yeah. so i didn't really i didn't train that whole month that or that month yeah it was it was it was a whole month uh-huh yeah i, I didn't train that whole month um but we were kind of like just staying active just kind of like i don't know using the the hotel room um, yeah. gyms and stuff like that um but yeah, that's the thing with like, you know, like when you say balance, like sometimes you just have to sacrifice things. Oh, like, for uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like, um, I remember before I left for the, for the second tour, I was like, this is gonna be a whole month without jitsu. So like I told like all like the upper belts and stuff in my gym, like, Hey, like give me hard rolls. Like I'm, I'm not going to do this for a month, like, you know, <laughs> beat the shit out of me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But don't like, you know, like hurt me. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, but yeah, it was sick, but, um, sometimes it does get a little hard to balance stuff. Yeah. But, it just depends on like where your priorities are and like what, sure. what you feel is best. Cause you know, there's what the heart wants and there's what like the brain mm. wants, you know, and, and what, so, so, what it needs to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's just about, you know, what's not what's more important to you, but like, what are you willing to sacrifice to yeah. like do what you want to do? Yeah. It's so interesting too. Cause I feel like as artists get like deeper and deeper into the careers, like longevity becomes a focus as well. Where mm-hmm. like in, as in the beginning, like they're all young. No one's thinking about that. No one's thinking like I need to be doing this 20 years in the future. You know, yeah. it's interesting. Like thinking about that sustainability aspect of it. Cause it's such like a, you would never think that would be part of music, but like because of touring, it becomes part of it, you know? Yeah. How do you guys like, I'd be curious to ask like, how picky are you with shows that you're taking? And then also, like, how do you balance, like, the world of, like, wanting to record versus, like, being a live band? 
it's mm, a good question. Um, so, hmm, we definitely pick and choose our shows now, and we kind of have to, yeah. You know, um, as to like, um, I mean, this just goes with any, like, pretty much like a. Mm-hmm. Hmm, how do I how do I put this in the words? If I'm playing, okay, for example, like let's say like I don't play LA for like two months, right? Yeah, I'm more. It's more probable to have a, a way more successful successful show, um, if I've had like a hiatus in a certain area. Yeah, and uh, versus if like I'm playing like interesting, yeah, yeah, like like the same town like every week, you know, then, yeah. like you'll see less and less people because people are gonna be like, oh, I can just see them next week, or I can just see them all like that time, you know, and so it thins your options. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And so we try to pick shows that are like um, that we don't really. Well, at least now, like we, we try to be more strategic about what shows we play and where. And then uh, as far as like recording and stuff, um, we plan that all that out in like like months in advance. Like, for example, uh, we're actually gonna be recording like another album in um, well, the rest of our album in April. So Sick. next month. Nice. Um, so we're going to do a hometown show April 20th. And then that's when we actually start recording. So we're going to go record and then mm-hmm. do a hometown oh, show. 420. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so it should be fun. <laughs> and uh, then we're going to record that whole week. And then we're just going to, yeah, I get, and then I think the show after that is just, um, we have another show in July that I can't really talk about yet. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're still, we're not just taking, sorry, we're not taking too many shows right now. Yeah. Just because we want to, like, really figure out our plan and, like, how to really, like, launch the album and stuff like mm. that. You know, like, um, when you get to a certain point, you really want to be more strategic is basically what I'm trying yeah. to say. Yeah. That's such an interesting thing, too, because, like, the, as, like, a smaller artist, that's never something you have to worry about because, like, any option you get, you're just juiced on, you know? But yeah. then eventually you get to a point where it's, like, the intricacies become so big. Like, we were talking earlier about, like, a certain show you did that was in Lancaster, or, or I'm sorry, what was, it was Palmdale, right? Mm-hmm. In Palmdale, and you were saying you had a lot of people who were driving up from L.A., mm-hmm. so you wanted to make sure, like, you know, they were there at a certain time because it's, like, driving back down from, like, a brewery is scary at that late at night. Yeah. So it's, like, things like that are, like, so big. Like, mm-hmm. I was helping a friend of mine book a show mm-hmm. a couple weeks ago, and we were looking at a bunch of different warehouses and stuff, and it was interesting he was talking about like, the demographic of his fan base and he, where in LA he thinks they live. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that's really interesting because it's like that can like really, really impact a show mm-hmm. or even like the time that you're doing it. Right. Like I think, you know, a six or like a six thirty or a seven o'clock time is really good in like a lot of cities, mm-hmm. but like maybe in LA that's not because some people, depending on where they're coming from, like you're going to have to commute at five o'clock and that's something people don't want to do. Or like, you know, in certain places in the city might be too far. Like there mm-hmm. are really so many small details that matter with like, if people are going to or not come to your show, you know? Oh yeah, definitely. And I think that's one of the things that I also picked up like, uh, like from being on the road, it's like what, what time are like people coming out to these shows, you know, and like what's like especially in like different cities, it's like what yeah, you know, like what time or for example, like in Chicago, like more people are tend to show up at eight o'clock, you know. Interesting, yeah. Yeah, for, like that's when the, it'll be the most dense in the venue and stuff like that. But that's just an example that I'm giving out, mm-hmm. you know. But um but yeah, there's a lot of log- logistics go out into planning and then it's like, okay, if I want to plan one show and I get an offer for another one, and sometimes I have to turn the other one down because I'm already playing in the same area. Yeah. Yeah, it's, so. it's like things like that that like really really matter, you know. Yeah. Even like um like things that are simple as like where you're playing, mm-hmm. like versus like another spot can like change if people will drive to that spot in the city, you know. Like yeah. I, I I suppose that's more of like an L.A. or like a New York thing, but it's mm-hmm. like I think like you probably want to refrain from like playing shows in certain parts of LA if they're like really out of the way of everything else, mm, okay, you know? Okay. Cause I feel like people won't come. And it's, mm-hmm. it's, I don't know. It's interesting how like intricate you can get with it, you know? Mm-hmm. What yeah. do you um think is like the biggest area over the years where you've like improved your live presence? Like when you first started performing Ooh. versus now, how have you kind of got to a place where you're more comfortable on stage? Um, honestly, before I used to get kind of nervous, you know, I used to get a little mm-hmm. bit of stage fright, but over the years, um, I've just kind of really leaned into it and I've used, and, and like, I've had to have a lot of talks with myself of like, you know, like how, like how much can I really like let loose on stage? And then mm, yeah. the thing I realized is like, you know, there's like what you hear on the album and then there's like what you see at our shows, you know? Yeah. And so I'm, I'm a very big believer. Well, first of all, we sound, I would say we sound 
way more lively and way more insane like in person than we do on like yeah. the record you know and that's because we record the record like years ago you know we were in a studio and wanted it to be good but you know live performances are in my opinion meant to be experiences and that's what i that's what that's the philosophy behind what i try to give people you know and so like that's why like whenever i now i play like i let loose i fucking you know i headbang as much as i can and yeah and, and not only that but like i use like my pedals and stuff to like create dynamics and like create atmospheres like um right now like um i think at our last show my my bassist and my guitarist were like trying to figure out like loops to play during the song so yeah. like you know because you never want a quiet moment during the set and you want to sure. you want like the set to be like you know you want you you definitely want to orchestrate it because you know it's kind of awkward when you play like a hard ass song and then it's like all right i'm just tuning now and it's quiet yeah you know? but um kills the energy yeah yeah but like i think that's where i'm trying to grow and i feel like i've grown mm. a lot but you know you can always continue to grow, especially when it comes to getting better at something like live performances is like, yeah. give something to the people that they're going to be like, I need to fucking see these guys again. Yeah. You know? And then that they're going to go and tell their friends like, Oh, we got to see these fucking guys, mm -hmm. you know? And the, like, I've always wanted to be a band that it's like that people say, Oh, they sound better live than they do on the record. Yeah. You know? and, and that's really like, I don't know. That's a very, that's something that I strive for all the time. Yeah. I think a lot of it too is like the process of making fans. Like I think, <laughs> that should be like the biggest goal at most live shows it's like kind of what you were saying it's like how do you go the extra mile to give these people experience where they're like there's no way i can like pass up seeing this person again you know and mm -hmm. a lot of the times that's like a lot deeper than the music mm -hmm. like a lot of that is like the feeling that you're able to curate in the room and that can come through like a lot of different things that can come through like talking to people after the show that can mm -hmm. come through like talking to people before the show and that can be like the bands you play with you know like there's such a specific level of like curation that goes into it. Yeah. And it's like, if you're not actively like curating a space where like you can think you have like a high probability of like, converting somebody to be a fan, like the show's probably not as worth it, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's funny. Cause like, um, you know, like uh, when we went on tour, we were the openers, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it sucks, but it's true. A lot of people are like, you know, who cares about the openers? Mm -hmm. But I, a lot of people will accept that. They'll be like, oh, you know, we're just opening. But no, fuck that. Like, I believe that, like, it, anytime we play, like, in front of a new crowd or, like, even if we're opening, like, I'm like, dude, I want to, and I'm reluctant on saying this, but I want to, like, I strive to set a standard, you know, at least for yeah. myself, you know, like, like not on no ego shit, but just, like, at least in my own personal way, I'm be like, okay, like, I want to play so fucking well that, like, we earn the respect of the crowd yeah and like people follow us immediately you know right there and, and so that way people are like like the people realize we're not just openers you know and like like i'm gonna play just as hard whether i'm headlining the fucking fonda versus if i'm like opening a gang is calling yeah know, which is like a small very small venue it was tight though sick venue good food, though. Good food. chinese restaurant yeah, yeah, yeah so yeah. dope dude th that that is something that i think like a lot of people can learn from though because i think you're right. I, I feel like a lot of people, like, all throughout music, will, like, take that opening spot as, like, maybe a sign of, not disrespect, but, like, as if you're lesser than a headliner, right? Mm -hmm. Which isn't necessarily true, because I think, like, if you're in a position where you're, you're you know, regardless of who you are, you're in front of a lot of people, mm -hmm. you kind of have a bit of an advantage to surprise them, I think. Mm -hmm. Like, I think I'm more inclined, because, like, I, I'm usually not going to a show where I don't know the headliner really unless I like know the opener and they're like a friend of mine or whatever but like you can really surprise people I feel like mm -hmm. and I feel like that aspect of like catching somebody off guard and getting them to be like holy shit like who is this mm -hmm. like it's really 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 advantageous you know yeah I, I, so I don't know like I feel like losing that ego about like the place where it's like I should be headlining this show or like I should be doing this you know it's like if you can get to that place where like you are getting those opportunities to be able to open for people too it's like dude yeah like there's uh, there's acts that i think of like made careers off support tours you know mm -hmm. Which definitely is like a huge thing yeah and, and like you know to kind of add to what to like what you're saying about like the whole like like oh i should be opening it or i should be like yeah like at the end of the day you don't have to take the show mm -hmm. you know like, yeah exactly um i i'm very i'm very like like uh take the shows that you believe will benefit you mm. you know or if like you know like for example, like uh, like like the other day, um, we just played the smell. And we 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 opened for we didn't open the whole show, but we opened for for Grave Secrets uh -huh. and like they're the homies, you know. And like I fucking love Vinny. Vinny, if you're watching this, I love you, dog. Um, oh, yeah. And yeah, and like you know they just been blowing up and stuff. And uh, 
I was happy to, you know, you know, play for them. And like, I wasn't going to yeah. be like, oh, well, I'm trying to headline or whatever, you know, like sometimes it's just, you know, just have fun, you know, yeah. like, like there's a certain like aspect to like taking your career seriously and also like not too seriously. Yeah. But I definitely want to, you definitely got to just like pick what you best is for you or pick what you think is best for you. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes I think too, I'm like, if you're going to take this too seriously, you should go be like a doctor or something because like <laughs> at least because you know what I mean though? It's like music is not necessarily meant to be taken like entirely wholly serious because it's like we obviously love it like it's all it's all of our lives but it's mm -hmm. like at a certain point like music could stop tomorrow and the world would be a lot less happy but the world wouldn't end mm -hmm. you know if we had no doctors the world would end so yeah. it's like it's important to acknowledge that like it really is a privilege to be able to like get to do this every single day you know so yeah. i think if you're not enjoying it like you got to find some way to enjoy it you know yeah definitely yeah, I feel like there's been points in my my life and my career where like I've let the I guess ego of success and like lack of patience like get to a place where like this has become not fun for me. It's mm -hmm. become like I need to be successful at this, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think like it's hard, right? Cuz you want to have fun, but you also need to take it seriously, you yeah. know? It's like how do you find that balance? It's very difficult to do, I feel like. Mhm. Mm it's a uh, Yeah, it can definitely be a little bit of a mind fuck sometimes, yeah. but uh I guess it just depends on what you're trying to do, uh -huh. you know? Um, and I guess like what it, 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 it also depends on like what you mean by take it seriously. True. You know, like, um, like when it comes to like actually conducting business with like promoters or booking agents, like, yeah. you know, I'm very like, um, I try to be transparent and I try to be like very upfront on like what I want when it comes to like, you know, selling a deal or a show or whatever. Mm -hmm. And like, um, those things you do have to take seriously, you know? For sure. and, and especially when it comes to like things like, um, yeah, just like conducting yourself and how you, like i guess deal with certain situations yeah. you know and uh yeah i mean it's just take it seriously but like not too serious yeah yeah, yeah yeah coming from like a land that's more diy i know you I know you mentioned that you guys um were like working with some booking agents and stuff now like how has it been getting to a place where you're able to kind of interact with the more traditional music industry coming from a side of things that exists in more diy space like have you been weary of it has it been hard like have you had good experiences um, I definitely know, I definitely like have like a, I guess I would say like, I know what to look out for, Yeah. you know, I know how to stay safe, at least for the most part, you know, there's a lot that I don't know still and I'm still figuring it out, but, um, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's definitely a blessing, you know, being able to like even hit up a booking agent and be like, Hey, I yeah. want to throw a show here, you know, but those are things that I feel like you just earned throughout time. You totally. Know? Like, uh, like even if like booking agents weren't hitting me up, like. I would still find a way to like do things on my own. Yeah. You know, and, um, and yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause there's like business people who get into music and there's music people who get into business. Yeah. And some people just like don't understand yeah. like how things work sometimes. And it's like, dude, there's etiquette, there's culture. Yeah. And there's like, just like unwritten rules that you have to follow uh -huh. sometimes. And it's like, I understand, you know, if you're trying to make a buck, but it's like, make it at least like for the band's sake, like, I don't know, I guess like have a consistent lineup, have like, you know, like, like for example, like you wouldn't throw, like, I guess, uh, a country band with a hardcore band, no. you know? But I know some promoters that would do that. If it made more money. Yeah, just yeah. to make a buck, you know? And then you got, like, very mixed crowds, you yeah. know? And so, um, yeah, th th that's what I would say. And, like, I feel like when it, com when I, when it comes to, like, booking shows and stuff, like, I very, li I, I very much like to be involved in, like, what bands play yeah. and stuff like that, just to make sure it's all, like, I guess, like, congruent. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's always been so weird to me and people come at throwing shows from an angle of like I just like as and from an angle that's as simple as like let me just book the biggest possible headline or uh, that I can and nothing else matters yeah that's always seems so silly to me like I don't know like all the shows that above the bridge throws like I never want them to feel like there's like a super clear headliner mm -hmm. like I don't want it to be like one band that's like you know that makes up 95 percent of the pool because I feel like those are way less community oriented you know mm -hmm. Um, like I think that can be cool if it's like a band that's like really big within a certain scene and then mm -hmm. they can like put on bands they like in that scene mm -hmm. but I don't know like kind of to your point like if you were just throwing bands out there that don't even know each other don't even know each other exist and play different kinds of music like you're not really providing a snapshot of a certain like subsection of music you're kind of just like putting people on a bill yeah <laughs> you know yeah. I don't know, because it's like you can either, I feel like they're throwing a show and there's like creating an experience. Those are two different things. And a lot of mm -hmm. the experience part of it, I think, come from like not just like the artists that are on stage, but also the feeling in the room. Like, do you feel like you're a part of like something in that moment, you know? Mm -hmm. It gets like so much bigger than that. Mm -hmm. 
And I, I figure I agree with you too in terms of like the live setting. I feel like a lot of people too in like the more traditional industry, I feel like undervalue the per, like the importance of live shows. Because mm-hmm. I feel like kind of like that more DIY community and like house show community and that, that sort of whole subsection of things. It feels like the holy grail of that is like live performance, right? It's like mm-hmm. the holy grail of that is like that experience of being in a room with somebody at the exact same time and feeling that energy. Mm-hmm. But it's so strange because I feel like some of the traditional industry exchanges that for literally just like vanity numbers on a screen, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and I feel like it, it must be, how have you got to a place where like you're able to manage like the more social media online side of things with kind of like the live presence stuff? Has that come natural to you? Or has, it been, has it been hard to kind of figure out how to do the social media stuff? The social media stuff, um, you know, like I'm 24, or I'm 20, no, I'm 23. I'm mm-hmm. going to be 24 in May, but, you know, like I'm starting to kind of see where like these younger cats kind of gap us. And Interesting, it's like, yeah. it, it's, it definitely gets like kind of tricky to keep up with sometimes, but, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I feel like I'm doing a pretty all right job at figuring totally. it out and stuff, and like yeah. especially working with people that like know that game, and then it's like it's a little easier, you know. Like I'll do research and stuff, and like you know, I, I will try to like like post at best times, and sometimes I'll experiment. Like, what happens if I post at this time, or like what kind of yeah. content, you know, do people like interact with more, you know? Um, but yeah, I would say like I'm doing all right at like figuring it out. Is uh, is that something you're trying to do more of, like outsource stuff like that? Like, or are you somebody that wants to have like a hand in every aspect of everything you guys are putting out? Hmm. Wait, what do you mean? Like, would you ever get somebody to, like, manage the social media side of things? Or, oh. Like, um, if, if if I had to say, and, like, if I got to, like, kind of oversee, like, what was going to be posted, yeah. you know, I, I think I think I would want to. Because I'll be honest, like, I'm not – I have, like, like how creative I am with, like, music. I'm not as creative when it comes to, like, you know, visual mm. stuff and stuff like that. So that's, yeah. that's where I, I have my challenges. Um, but, yeah, I mean, if I could, like, get, like, a social media manager or something like that, like – I'd, I'd be in for that, you know, yeah. just so, that, so that I can focus on other stuff more. Yeah, know? yeah. Dude, I feel like that's definitely where you want to be. Like, it's one thing that I think a lot of managers get wrong that I've always found very interesting is, like, they expect musicians to be filmmakers and not yeah. musicians, you know? Like, it's yeah. such, like, I think they undervalue just what percent of the brain it takes to, like, be a musician every single day that comes up yeah. with ideas and, like, work through those dry spells and get to a place where like, you're putting out consistent music, you know? Like, yeah. putting out, like, mini music videos and short films and, like, even, like, TikTok content and stuff like that is, like, a whole other thing you have to dive into. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, like, like I mean, I, I, I know a few bands that are, like, uh, I mean, I've come across a few bands that are, like, very good. They have good music. They have yeah. good, like, you know, they're good live, but they just don't know how to do, you know, social yeah, media or dude. really market themselves. And so they'll post stuff that, like, maybe some people won't find, like, you know, appealing or, like, super shiny. And, like, they would be like, oh, whatever, and just scroll past, you know. Yeah. Bro, that shit's the worst. <laughs> I, I fucking hate when, like, have you ever had an experience like this when you find an act that you're like, this person is so talented and so good, but they don't really comprehend, like, like the business of this. Yeah, and I then hate that. and then it shows and it's like, yeah. oh dude, like you got to be more professional and stuff, yeah. you know. Yeah. It just like sucks, dude, cuz it's like I don't know, part of me feels like like art shouldn't even like dive into business, right? Like yeah. the stuff that is seen should be the best stuff in theory, right? Mm-hmm. But it, it it's often not. <laughs> like there's so many art cuz but it's also like exciting mm-hmm. because like there's the idea that there's like some kid somewhere in Washington who like barely has a cell phone plan and like doesn't have any social media, but it could be the next like Kurt Cobain yeah, is like insane to me. Like that's what yeah. like gets me the most excited, you know? Yeah. And, and it's cool. Cause like TikTok has given like so many artists, like such a big platform and it's so not easy, but mm. it's like, it's a lot more easy compared to like 10 years ago. For totally. Them, like blow up and like find their audience and stuff like that. Yeah. So, so, you know, kudos to those figuring it out and, like, yeah. you know, that know what they're doing. Dude, I never resonate with people who get, like, upset at the idea of TikTok for music because I've always seen it as such a positive. I like, have, too. You know, like, a lot of people are like, oh, they're a TikTok band or this band. And it's like, dude, who fucking cares? Like, yeah. Like, they're, what, you mad that you're, you didn't get that many that views you're or not? what? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And it's also, like, I feel like, I don't know, like, I generally feel like whatever is blowing up is what is supposed to blow up a lot like even theoretically right if like a label dumped a fuck ton of resources into something and it like unnaturally blew up like that will run its course that Mm. never ever like has staying power right yeah i think like there is no way to like rig this industry i don't really believe that i think like if 
I, I do really think the best music always rises to the top because at the end of the day, the only dictation that matters is that of the people. It's like mm-hmm. if somebody has enough manpower behind them and enough fan power and enough people who like want to hear their music, they will succeed. Like point blank period, you know? Yeah. 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 It's, it's super interesting to see like, I don't know. Like I wonder if we'll get to a place where like it kind of reverts and like bands are like way more like, cause I think we're seeing it a little bit already. Like I think there is a bit of like a revolt against it right now. Mm-hmm. Like especially more so than there was in like 2020, 2021 where like, it was kind of all or nothing. Like mm-hmm. you were either like on it and doing it every single day mm-hmm. or you weren't like, yeah. Now I feel like people are like taking more time sometimes and like mm-hmm. putting out higher quality stuff, but like using the apps more strategically. Right. And, and that's how it should be. You know, like yeah. um, if you're just spamming the timeline with like a whatever video, then yeah. you're going to get whatever people like looking at your stuff, <laughs> yeah. you know, and like, like, and you're going to get whatever, different types of people like commenting on your stuff and like, you know, and, and yeah. that's the thing about like, that kind of thing it could also be like a bad thing right so like if a lot of people start bagging on you or or whatever for your content um people are gonna follow that you know and they're gonna be like oh well you know just because they see like how many likes a a bad comment got and they'd be like oh well i'm just gonna yeah for fun or whatever have you experienced that luckily no okay yeah yeah. Yeah. luckily i haven't been flamed on yet or anything yeah i think i posted but yeah dude i always feel so bad when you like you're scrolling through tiktok and you see an artist that just gained like shit on in the comments and you always go to like the person who like did the comment they have like you know zero followers zero following or whatever and yeah. you can tell they just like they they do this to a lot of people and they yeah. don't want anybody to like track them or like have anything to say against them yeah literally like i i saw this um i saw a tiktok the other day of uh it was literally just like some some band playing in like a park or something and like there was a lot of crowd there was a lot of like kids there and like you know like they were vibing, you know, like it didn't look like they were being weird or anything. And then like all the comments were like, Oh, like TikTok Riz party. Oh, like all these, like they're posers, this and that. I'm like, dude, they're, first of all, they're like all together. They're all hanging out. They're watching a live band yeah. and they're there. What are you doing? You're sitting behind your keyboard complaining about a bunch of kids watching live music. Yeah. Like, you know? And so it's just like, I don't know. It's so unnecessary to like just hate on stuff like that, you know. Also, and, like <laughs> this is always a weird thought. Like, I always try to picture myself like doing that, and I just never can. Like, I'm like, how do people like have that much time? Like, <laughs> yeah, it, it's. I I feel like it's just a lot of like unfiltered like anger and stuff that yeah. they have. You know, maybe they. I don't know. Maybe it's just like a deep insecurity or something that people have of like stop having fun. You know. It's yeah. Like, I don't know. I can understand it. It always feels like it's rooted in that too. It's like everything you're hating on is something you want, you know, a lot yeah, of the time. Yeah, I feel like, real. yeah, like that video that you were talking about, I feel like a lot of those people never have had like a deep sense of community, whether it be musical or non musical, you know? Mm-hmm. Which is, which is in, in general a sad thing. Yeah. Or they're in one of those bands that focus on like how many people come to the show rather than like what they're playing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, last thing I want to ask you mm-hmm. if you had like one message that you could spread through your music, when you're all done, everything's said and done, and bed is no more, or even like just at any point in the in the career, what would that message be? Dang. Hmm. I guess you can always be kinder. Hmm. Damn, that's beautiful. <laughs> that's really true. Yeah. Yeah. I I've been through a lot of a lot of a lot of shit where it wouldn't have. Or I guess things could have gotten better if like if like either i or the other person had just been a little kinder mm. you know and like like um for, like i guess like if i were to meet that person that was like talking shit to all these kids you know like um you know like oh they're just posing just like it's like dude like do you want to come to a show like are you you chilling you're right you know yeah because like people are always going through stuff man mm. you know and like there's so much more more like it's so much less work to just be like hey man like you're right then like mm. fuck you and like you know I guess to start, you know, that whole thing. Yeah. And it's so much easier to lead with empathy too. Like, yeah. to like make sure like your reaction to those situations, like those potentially bad things that people were saying is not like, fuck you, but more so like, why do you feel like that? Yeah. And it's just like, like, um, I don't know. Like on my way here, like I got cut off like pretty bad. And then like, I was just kind of like, ah, oh, like, okay. Like whatever. Yeah, that shit happens. Like, yeah. Like, 
I don't know. Sometimes things don't need to be. Some sometimes things just aren't that deep, you know. Yeah. And some people like they take it to heart, and it's just like you know, just be kinder. Yeah, it's easier to move on that way. You'd, it would be hard to die with a bunch of hatred in your heart. Yeah, literally. <laughs> For sure. Bed. Thank you, brother. That Thank was you, a lot of fun, man. Dude, yeah, that went by so quick. Fifty-four yeah, right? minutes. Almost an hour. Damn. Crazy. Yeah, bro. Thank you for the conversation. I appreciate it. Of course. Thank you for having me. It was yeah. a lot of fun. Hell yeah. I love your music. Very excited to see it. Happy dabs and future shows coming up, man. But yeah, thank pump you, for what you guys you. Com- got coming down the line. Um, we're dropping a few singles. We're recording an album. Don't know when that'll be out, but we have a banger of a fucking show lined up for the end of the year. I don't know when this is going to come out, but probably hopefully before that show. Yeah. So uh, just keep an eye on us. Bed.band, Instagram, bed self-titled, I guess. Hell yeah. Cool. Thank you, brother. Appreciate you, man. man. All right. Music matters.